Amen. It is good to see everybody this morning. Happy Resurrection Day. Amen. Amen. That's what we're here for, right? Let's all stand. We're going to sing hymn number 150. He lives. I serve. Let's start that over. Where are we at? I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of joy. And just the time He needs me, I'm always here. He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me. could be no life. Where would that leave us? Amen. Amen. Let's all bow our heads. Brother Sam comes and prays for us this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. And Lord, we thank you for this special, special day that we celebrate the resurrection, Lord, of your son who died on the cross and after three days resurrected so that we all too can have a resurrection one day and beat death. And Lord, I pray that you'll bless the services today. Be with all of those that are absent. Be with those that are sick. Bring them back to us safely. Thank you for our visitors that are here today. Lord, I pray that you'll anoint our pastor, Lord. Uh, give him the, the strength uh, to give your word in your precious name. Amen.
down the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem that day. The soldiers tried to clear the narrow street, but the crowd pressed in to see the man condemned to die on Calvary. He was bleeding from a beating. There were stripes upon his back. And he wore a crown of thorns upon his head. And he bore with every step the scorn of those who cried out for his death. Down the Via Dolorosa all the way of suffering like a lamb came the messiah christ the king but he chose to walk that road out of his love for you and me down the via dolorosa all the way to Calvary. Por la vía dolorosa, triste día en Jerusalén, los soldados le abrían paso a Jesús. Mas la gente se acercaba para ver al que llevaba aquella cruz por la vía dolorosa es la vía del dolor como oveja vino Cristo Rey Señor y fue el quien quiso ir por su amor por ti por mí por la vía dolorosa al calvario y a morir the blood that would cleanse the souls of all men made its way to the heart of Jerusalem down the Via Dolorosa all the way of suffering like a lamb came the Messiah Christ the King but he chose to walk that road out of his love for you and me down the via dolorosa all the way to Calvary Thank you, Victor. That was good. Let's all stand, shall we? Welcome, everybody. Happy Resurrection Day. Give everybody a holy welcome as well.
to see everybody this morning. <clears throat> it's good to be here. And uh, I, uh, I was able to, sit to make my birthday last for about a month. And so I've celebrated that, had a great, great time with it. Got back from Texas, got sick on the plane going to Texas. So uh, that was an interesting experience. I've had bronchitis, and uh, so I was trying to preach in Texas with no wind. And you, you got to have a lot of wind in Texas. And, uh, but anyway, we had a wonderful time there, and on the way back, my wife got it, so she's home with bronchitis, and, and uh, she's a few days behind me in recovery. I feel fine. I'm still doing a lot of coughing. And uh, so if you can tolerate that, we'll get through the service this morning. It's so good to see all of you that's here. And uh, I can't believe Miss Emma is here. Wow. We are so happy. I tell you, Emma has been good for our prayer life. And uh, we have sure been praying for you, Emma. It's so good to see you in the service. Good to see visitors here and see you, everyone that, that's able to be back with us. And we're so glad to have you. And tonight we'll be observing the Lord's Supper. And uh, so don't forget that. You know, it, there, there's, sometimes there's something good about getting older. There are some benefits to getting older. Amen. This, this elderly couple had, were celebrating their 60 years of marriage. And they had retired. They moved back to the old neighborhood where they grew up in. And uh, so they were reminiscing together, and they moved right back into the same area where they used to go to school. So they, they got up that day, and they walked down to the old school. And uh, holding hands, they walked in. The building was unlocked. They even found, uh, even found a chair that he had carved back when they were high school sweethearts in there. Uh, where he had carved in that, uh, in that uh, uh, chair, Alex loves Sally. And so they were walking back home, and an armored truck come through, and a big bag fell out of that armored truck. Well, Sally picked it up, and uh, she carried it home, opened it up, it had $50,000 in it. And so Alex said, well, we've got to give it back. She said, uh-uh, finders keepers. And uh, so they were discussing that, so she put it up in the attic. Well, the next day, two, uh, two uh, policemen were out searching the neighborhood, canvassing, trying to find out if anybody had seen anything. So these two uh, policemen walked up to them, knocked on the door, they came in, he said, uh, we're, did either of you happen to see a, a bag uh, full of money? And uh, she said, no. And he said, she's lying, said she hid it up in the attic. She said, oh, don't pay any attention to him. He's going senile. <laughs> and they said, well, they looked at him and said, well, tell us the story. Tell us the story. He said, well, said, we were walking back yesterday from school. He said, FBI agent looked over the other and said, I'm out of here. So, <laughs> sometimes there's some advantages of getting older, amen. The choir's going to sing.
again. We're going to turn to hymn number 149. Let's all stand as we sing, Because He Lives, We Can Face Tomorrow. God sent His Son. They call Him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Good to see everybody here this morning on Easter Resurrection Sunday. We've got some announcements we want to make. Of course, today, right after services, and I'll say more about this at the end of services, but we do have several different Easter egg hunts that will be going on uh, outside accordingly to their grades and ages, and we'll give you more of the details on that after the services, at the end of the services before you head out. Don't forget, of course, tonight is Lord's Supper. And tonight after church, we are going to be having something different. We're going to be having an adult Easter egg hunt. Amen? How many of you have never been on an adult Easter egg hunt? You're in for a treat tonight. They've got uh, uh, all kinds of prizes that they're going to be giving out. Uh, jewelry, gift cards to restaurants, $200 in, in cash prizes, um, uh, deer feeder, Custom-made pens, all kinds of different things that adults would like. This is for teenagers uh, and adults. And so uh, we want to encourage you to come out and be a part of this after the services tonight. And we'll give you more info on that tonight as well. Uh, don't forget, uh, coming up here in April, on April 13th, we've got uh, Cammie's and Eddie's uh, bridal shower. This is going to be here at the church at 2 p.m., and so their wedding date's coming up on May 18th. And so they'll be having their bridal shower coming up here on the 13th of April. So don't forget that. Also, the street ministry on the 13th, men will be having a, a breakfast fellowship on the 16th at Perkins. This will be at 8.30 a.m. And uh, this is just right down the road here. Senior ladies will be going on the 18th. They'll be having a senior lunch. The youth rally will be on the 19th. They'll be going to Bible Baptist in DeLand. Veterans will be having a veterans meeting on April the 20th. They'll be meeting at Cafe Perks. This is going to be at 1130. Spouses are invited. And then also on the 27th, our churchwide ladies and teen spring fellowship. This is for all of our church ladies. Uh, those of you that are visiting, you're welcome to attend. This will be at 5 o'clock in the uh, Family Life Center on the 27th. So we want to encourage everybody to look at your um, bulletin. And we've got a lot of things going to be coming up here in the month of April. 
All right, let's all stand one more time. Stretch your legs. We're going to sing hymn number 176 in times like these. <laughs> Remain standing and open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Boys and girls, you can slip out for Children's Church, and ushers, would you come? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Everybody find it in your Bibles. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Begin reading with me in verse 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Beyond death is the resurrection. And we're going to look at that this morning. Father, we love you. It is so good to be in your house this day, Lord. Thank you for what this day represents. Thank you for our Savior that loved us so much to die for us, even while we were yet enemies and sinners, that he loved us that much. Thank you, dear God, that, that the story doesn't end with death, but with the resurrection. And we pray this morning, Lord, that you will bless the service. I pray if there's one man or woman or a boy or girl, a teenager that does not know you personally as their Savior, I pray today they'll open their heart to you, Jesus. Lord, we ask you to bless the offering. We give it to you with our heart. We love you in Christ's name. Amen.
walked away Nothing to say They just lost their dearest friend All that he said Now he was dead So this was the way it would end The dreams they had dreamed Were not what they'd seen Now that he was dead and gone The garden, the jail The hammer, the nail How could a night be so long? Then came the morning Night turned into day The stone was rolled away Hope rose with the dawn Before the sun Death had lost And life had won For morning had come The angel, the star The kings from afar Wedding, the water, the wine Now it was done They'd taken her son Wasted before his time She knew it was true She'd watched him die too Call him just a man But deep in her heart Knew from the start Somehow her son Would live again Then came the morning Night turned into day The stone was rolled Before the sun Death had lost And life had won For morning had come Death had lost And life had won For morning had come Thank you, Tom and Victor and choir. Thank you for the blessings this morning in music. We appreciate Lee standing in for Miss Susan while she's out of town. And uh, glad to have everybody here. Open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it asks this question. It says, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Now, the reason why the Scripture states that is because the historical evidence for the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is just overwhelming. Uh, To anyone that's honestly willing to take a look at this. You know, when you look at Buddha, the earlier Scriptures that were written were written 700 years after Buddha's death. When you look at Muhammad, the earliest scriptures were over a hundred years after his death. But when you look at the the writings concerning Christ, there were those that wrote while he was alive that were eyewitnesses, Matthew, Mark, and John, 
were eyewitnesses. They saw it. Luke came along shortly after and carefully chronicled everything that was written. But we don't just have those. The Bible talks about the infallible proofs. What do you mean, infallible proofs? Well, the Jewish Talmud, which is a collection of, of historical writings of legal, civil, and, and uh, religious records, all of them were enemies of Christ. Yet the Talmud records, and it verifies the existence of Jesus, that He was a teacher. It verifies His trial, His crucifixion, even verified that He performed miracles, though they attributed it to sorcery. But they recorded in real time that life of Jesus, His death, and the miracles that He performed. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, wrote this. He talked about how that He performed surprising feats, he says. He goes on and, and talks about how that Jesus was able to win over Jews and Gentiles by performing miracles. And then he states that he was condemned under Pilate. He was crucified and then appeared restored after three days. Now the interesting thing here is Josephus was not a Christian. He was an enemy of the Christians. And as was the writers of the Talmud, all of them enemies, the last people in the world you would think that would affirm that Jesus Christ was who He said He was, that He died, and that He rode again. But it doesn't end there. There are other writings. For example, uh, the Roman governor, Pliny the Younger, wrote about these Christians. And he talked about how that they would not recant, even though they were uh, threatened with death, and could have spared their life, they would not recant because, he says, he wrote, that they honored Christ as their God. Uh, there were also two witnesses that record events of that day. Uh, one of those was Thallus, who wrote in 52 AD. And he talks about how that on that day, on the exact day of the crucifixion, how the sun was darkened on that exact day. Now, he was hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem, but he talks about this darkening of the sun exactly as Scripture records. And then there was a Greek author by the name of Philegion who lived much closer, and he wrote about that same day, the crucifixion. He not only mentioned the darkness, but he mentioned the earthquake. Uh, the Bible says there are infallible proofs. These are some of those proofs. In addition, there were eyewitnesses that saw Christ. 500 saw Him at one time. The disciples saw Him on multiple occasions. Uh, these were all willing, and at the time that this was being written, many of those were still alive and could have easily stood up and, and rebuked it had it not been the truth. Infallible proofs, the Bible says. So what do you do with this? The fact that the tomb was empty. How do you explain that? You can't deny that Christ was not historical. There's too many evidences that He was. Can't deny the miracles. Can't deny the empty grave. Well, there's been several attempts. What, one attempt was this, that Jesus did not actually die. They called it the swoon explanation. That Christ, they took Him off the cross. They put Him in the tomb. He didn't actually die. And he slipped out during the night. Now, th th think about that a little bit. If somebody took you, beat you half to death with a cat of nine tails, take you, nail you to a cross, drive a spear through your side, drag you into a, a tomb, seal it with a huge boulder, you think you could get up, push that boulder away? The next day, walk seven miles with two men. At, with, I mean, come on. Nobody, nobody really believes the swoon theory. Someone else says, well, <clears throat> the, the Jews hid his body. Really? You know, the Jews were trying to show that Jesus was a charlatan, that they, that they didn't want to believe him. All they had to do to stop this new movement in its tracks was just produce his body. 
Why would they not have done that? Certainly they would have. The Roman soldiers, they stole the body. Well, what would they do with it? They've got this problem on their hands, the same solution the Jews have. All they've got to do is produce the body of Jesus, and that ends this thing right here. Well, his disciples stole his body. Yeah, they were a brave lot, weren't they? Christ is hanging on the cross. You can't even find them. They've all run and hid. Peter's denied him three times, and he's quit and left the ministry, went back to fishing. Uh, no. Each one of those later died testifying that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again, and they saw him. Where did they get that kind of boldness? And would they die for a lie? When they could have saved their lives? Most all of the apostles died horrible deaths. And all they had to do was recant. That's all they asked. And just, just admit that Jesus Christ did not rise from the grave. They died testifying that Christ did die. And that's exactly what the Roman governor Pliny was writing about when he talks about that they would not recant. They died stating that Jesus rose from the grave. I'm saying to you, when you listen to the eyewitness and when you look at the effect that the resurrection of Christ has had on people for hundreds of years, it is real, isn't it? Now, Paul writes concerning death. And he says that the important thing here is to remember that Christ rose. But his resurrection was not just for him. That word resurrect means to stand up again. And he's telling us that when we die, when a Christian dies, they're going to stand up again. And so here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the, the passage ends in verse 18 in a beautiful way. It says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Because this passage of scripture was written specifically to encourage people during the loss of a loved one. And the Bible teaches there's a great difference between the death of an unbeliever and the death of a, of a child of God. Because in Paul's day, there was real discouragement about death. Uh, in his day, the philosophers had held little hope. One tombstone read like this, I was not, I became, I am not. They believed that there was nothing beyond the grave. But the Bible said that Jesus died for us so that we might not despair. And he writes, he said, I would not have you to be ignorant. I want you to understand exactly what happens beyond the grave. And he gives us three certainties here in this passage of Scripture. He talks about the certainty of death. And look at verse 13. He said, I would not have you. Everybody, 1 Thessalonians 4, everybody with me? All right. He said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now take your pen, underline that word asleep. That you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Jesus brought a whole new idea about death. Pain may precede death, but dying is really, uh, the Bible teaches us <clears throat> that death itself is not <clears throat> a painful experience. <clears throat> he says that it's like a sleep. He said that when, when a, a person dies, <clears throat> Paul calls it a sleep. Now that's a whole new idea. That's something that they'd not understood before. But when Jesus went down to Lazarus, and uh, Lazarus had been dead four days, his body was already decaying. And his sisters met him and they were so heartbroken. And Jesus said to them that Lazarus sleepeth. Now, what does that mean? Uh, he certainly, his physical body had gone through death. But Jesus called that the, de the death of Lazarus sleep. Thank you, Tim. He says that, Lazarus sleepeth, and he went and he called Lazarus by name. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible tells us that he came out of that tomb. And uh, when, when a person dies, the Bible teaches if you're a Christian, 
It's like falling asleep. That's the terms that's used. Paul said, I'm writing concerning those that are asleep that you sorrow not like those who don't have any hope. Uh, I've presided over hundreds of funerals and there is a big, big difference when you're, when you're dealing with a family that knows their loved one is a Christian and that they'll see them again <clears throat> from <clears throat> those who have no hope. I've seen services <clears throat> where there was no hope. I've watched them literally crawl into the casket with the deceased because they felt they're gone. They will never, ever, ever see them again. But for Christians, the Bible tells us that's not the way it is at all. A little boy asked his mother, he said, what's it like, Mom, to die? And she said, son, do you remember that when you were little and you'd fall asleep? And you remember that <clears throat> when you would wake up, you'd wake up in your bed with your pajamas on all covered up and tucked away? And he said, uh, yes. She said, well, just like your dad and I would lovingly pick you up and, and tuck you away, carry you to your room. When a Christian dies, angels come. And they take them up, pick them up, and they take them and put them in the big strong arms of God who puts them exactly where they're supposed to be in heaven, just like we did with you. That's what the Bible describes. That for a Christian, the Bible tells us, that death is not something to be feared. And so he writes this and said, I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to be ignorant about what it means to die when you're a Christian. And then he talks secondly about the certainty of the resurrection. Look at verse 14. He says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He tells us that when a Christian dies, uh, our souls are separated from our physical bodies. And our soul instantly goes to be with God. I want everybody to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Everybody find that passage and uh, I want you to look at it with me. Everybody take time to find it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And look at what it says. And we're going to look at the first eight verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that's talking about your body when you physically die, we know that if our earthly house were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. When a Christian dies, your body goes to the grave. But your soul, which is who you are, that lives in that house, immediately gets translated to a new house. Do you see that? He says, for in this we groan. In our bodies we groan, <clears throat> earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Our bodies are temporal. Our bodies have issues. They get bronchitis in their lungs. <laughs> we have all kinds of problems, don't we? We groan in those problems. But he says, If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for this selfsame thing is God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the spirit. Now that word earnest, you ever heard the expression earnest money? The down payment? We have the Holy Spirit in us. That's just the down payment of what God has for us in heaven. Alright? He says we have this earnest of the Spirit. He says, therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Amen. So he tells us here in this passage of Scripture, 
He's telling us, he's talking about the certainty of the resurrection. He says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, he says, here in verse 14, 1 Thessalonians 4, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He explains how this is going to happen. He says in verse 16, he says, there's going to be a shout. There's going to be a shout in the heavens. There's going to be a voice of an archangel. And then he tells us here in the passage, he says, then the, then the dead in Christ shall rise first. The trump of God shall sound, and wow, we're going to be out of here. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it happened on a Sunday morning? I've always wished that that could be the case. That we could all be in church together when that, when that trumpet sounds, and we could all just go up together what an opportunity that would be. But he tells us here that all that are buried, he says, those that, have, those that will not prevent those which are asleep, those that who are buried shall be resurrected. That word resurrection means to stand up again. Those that's been buried are going to stand up again. doesn't matter if the body has been buried in some mausoleum somewhere or if it's been buried in the heart of the earth or, uh, or at, in the depths of the sea or if it's been cremated. God's going to refurbish and cause your body to stand up again. And folks, that's because of today. Because of the resurrection. When Christ rose, He defeated death. He defeated death for everyone. And all of us are going to get to experience resurrection because Christ arose. Do you see why this is such a significant day? Now, the president has found another declaration for today. But I think we all need to realize that what's really important is the resurrection of Christ. That Christ rose this day. And the Bible tells us that he said, he said, I, he said I don't want you to, I, I want you to understand this. And they said, well, how, this is hard to understand. How can this be so? And so he explains it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So turn with me there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is called the resurrection chapter because it deals with the resurrection more completely, more fully than any other passage in the Bible. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and we're going to look at verse 35 and following. 1 Corinthians 15, 30, everybody there? Yeah. All right. He says, but look at verse 35. Some men will say, how are the dead raised up? I mean, how, how's this going to happen? And if so, with what body, they said, do they come? Scripture says, thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain, but God giveth it a body, as it hath pleased Him, and to every seed His own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also in the resurrection of the dead, it is sown in incorruption, it is raised in corruption. Now, he says, you're asking, how can this be? How can a body go to the grave? And stand up again when it decays and rots, and disintegrates. And so scripture says, why are you struggling with this? You see it every day in your life. You take a grain of seed, you put it in the ground, and what does it do? It decays. You, you dig it up and it, it has rotted in the ground. But give it a little while. And it comes forth from that seed that decayed and died. It comes forth new life. And the new life, the body of that new life, is unlike the seed. You know, I grew up on a farm. We would 
take a grain of corn and put it in the ground. But what came up out of the ground was totally different from what went into the ground. Uh, you take soybean, you take cotton seed, you place those in the ground, these two little velvet leaves come up from there. Uh, that body that went into the ground deteriorates and dies. But God, who made the seed, brings forth a new body out of that seed. And he says, so why is this so difficult? The same God that made your body will bring a new body out of the grave. So he says here, he says, to be dead in Christ, it says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's the first resurrection. And he says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to be with them in the clouds. So he says, he says the, the saved will all be caught up together. We call that the rapture. It's the idea of like a bird that flies down out of the air and raptures, grabs something and swoops it up into the air. It says that we shall be caught up together to meet them in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So he deals here with the certainty of death. And then he talks about the certainty of the resurrection. And then notice he talks about the certainty of heaven. He says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wow, what a promise. That's what this day is about. That's right. It's the promise of resurrection. He tells us here that we shall be gathered together. There's an interesting phrase found in the Old Testament. And uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 25, verses 8 and 9. Genesis chapter 25. Abraham, the Bible tells us, gave up the ghost and he died. He says, in good old age, an old man, full of years. And then it says this, and was gathered to his people. Take your pen and underline that phrase. He, he was gathered to his people. Look at, look, at the, look at the sequence. He died, gathered to his people. And they buried his body. All right, you see that? He died, gathered to his people. That means he went to heaven. And he, they buried his body. His son Isaac, look in Genesis chapter 35, verse 29. Isaac, look at how the scripture gives it to us. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died. And here it is again. And was gathered unto his people being old and full of days, and his sons buried him. You see the sequence? He died, gathered to his people, and they buried his body. To give you another example, look at Jacob, the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham. Genesis chapter 49, verse 33. It says that he was gathered to his people. Now that's the Old Testament phrase for being caught up together as it gives us here in 1 Thessalonians. Gathered to the people. When you're caught up together, together with whom? You're gathered with your people. When Moses was about to die in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 49 and 50, God said to Moses, He said, get thee up into the mountain and die and catch this and be gathered unto thy people. Well, now, does this mean that they're going to take the body of Moses back to Egypt where his parents and grandparents were? No. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, the Bible tells us that God buried Moses in the mountains of Moab. So when it tells us that he was gathered under his people, it means that when Moses died, the soul leaves the body. The soul immediately is gathered unto his people. And they bury the body. So remember, remember in the Bible with David? Remember when David had a child that was, a, that was dying? And the Bible says that as that child is dying, David would not eat, he would not sleep, he would not bathe. And then the word comes to him that the baby is dead. And the Bible says when that happened, David got up and he bathed himself and began to eat. And his disciples said to him, they said to, those followers said to David, I, we don't understand. You wouldn't eat while the baby was still alive and the baby dies and now you go and eat and bathe and all of that. And in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 22 and 23, 
David said this. He said, I can't bring the child back to me. But he said, I can one day go to be with the child. So the Bible teaches us, he's talking about being gathered to his people. When a Christian dies, Scripture says it's like going to sleep. It's just like falling asleep. And the angels are going to pick you up and take you. And the Bible tells us that the Lord is going to be there with them. So God's even going to help with the transition. And all of that, when we are taken up, we're going to be moving from here to there. Angels are going to come and help us with the moving. Isn't that a good thing? Amen. But the Bible tells us that we, one day we shall be gathered and, and we're going to be known there. When, when, Lazarus, when Lazarus was on, on earth, he was called Lazarus. When Lazarus was dead, he was still called Lazarus. You will be you and I'm going to be me. And the Bible tells us that we're going to be with them. So it says, so shall we be, be gathered with them. Who's the them? Who's the them? All of the family of God that has gone on to heaven. That's the them. And here's what's exciting to me is that I'm going to know everybody in heaven. How will you know that? Because God by intuition will place that into us. Just like He programs uh, animals to fly or to go or to do something, it's, He programs them. God's going to download the names of all of the family of God into our system. And when I, when I get to heaven, I have a terrible time remembering names here on earth. Uh, I, I struggle. I, I, and most folks can remember faces but can't remember names, and I struggle with both. They turn me around twice, man. You gotta introduce, I, I wake up in a new world every day. And make matters worse. I've depended on my wife you know, for over 50 years of preaching because she never forgets a face and uh, seldom forgot a name. And she's not able to be with me, so I'm, I'm in bad shape. But when I get to heaven, I'm going to know you. And you're going to know me. And we're going to know brothers and sisters from every country under the earth. We're going to know them and they're going to know us. You know what's going to be a blessing? <clears throat> there are people that your life has touched that you don't have any idea. You had no, you, you've never met them, but your life touched theirs. I was preaching a meeting years ago <clears throat> in uh, Missouri, and a man came to me after service and said, Brother Riggs, he said, I've been wanting to meet you. And I said, uh, all right. And I said, what is your name? He gave me his name. He said, you don't know me, but he said, you were preaching in Waterloo, Mississippi. And he said, they put you on the radio, and he said, where I work at, my boss is a Christian, and said, uh, when you would preach every day, they would turn, they would turn the radio on, and they would let the, all the workers take a break for 30 minutes and listen to you preach. Wow. And he said, I heard you preach, and said, I got saved. Wow. And he said, I, I've, ne- I've lost you, I didn't know where to where you got off to. And he said, I, I heard that you were preaching a meeting here. He said, I want you to know I'm a, I'm a preacher and I pastor a church about 60 miles from here. I never met him. I did not know that my life touched his life. You're going to see people in heaven that's going to come up to you. You had no idea that God somehow used your life to bless their life. Maybe you passed out a gospel tract to somebody and they picked it up. Maybe somebody met someone that you had touched, that touched their life. That's the them. We're going to be gathered together with them to meet the Lord in the air. But another special thing about it is, is that although we will know everybody, we still have our people. We still have our people. You know, I would like to thank, I've pastored some of you now for 35 years. Some of you, I'm the only pastor you've ever known. Bless your heart. (laughs) But in heaven, I'm not going to be just another preacher up there that went to heaven. You're going to be special to me. I'm going to be special to you. And when we get to heaven, our family's there. My mama, my daddy, my grandparents, 
my great-grandparents that I never got to meet, they're going to be there. Uncles and aunts, people that are so precious in my life. That's them. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. I don't want you to to fail to understand this because this is so important. Resurrection Sunday, because he rose, we're guaranteed that we're going to rise. His was just the down payment. It was the earnest. That was the first resurrection. Then he says that one day, it'll be just a normal day. We'll all be busy doing our thing. Folks will be marrying and giving in marriage. We're going to be resurrected. I mean, Eddie, that may happen just before y'all get married. <laughs> it, but it'll be just a normal day. And it says that the dead in Christ are going to rise first. We get a, we get a six-foot jump. Amen? It says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then it says we who are alive and remain at that moment, we're going to be translated and we're going to meet them in the air. Christ is coming to get us and we're going to be taken back up with Him with them. Who's the them? All of the family of God that's preceded us. And the Bible tells us, so shall we ever be with the Lord. We'll never be separated ever again. <clears throat> we're never going to go through the trials like we're going through now. We'll never experience another death because death is unnatural. It's not normal. That's done away with. Because the Bible tells us death will have lost its sting. And it says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And he says, so take these words and let it be a comfort to you. I want you this morning realize this. God has such wonderful plans for everyone if they'll just open their heart and accept Him as their Savior. Everyone. God says, I've got a gift. I want to give to you. And it's the gift of forgiveness. Outside New York City, there's a tombstone It does not have the name of the person whose grave it marks. It doesn't have the date of birth. It doesn't have the date of departure. It just has one word on it. But it's the greatest word that could ever be written. It's the word forgiven. Forgiven. Christ says, I have a gift I want to give to you. It's called forgiveness. Forgiveness. But he'll not force it into your life. Jesus is a perfect gentleman. He'll never barge his way into your life. But he said this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. If you'll just open the door, I will come in. What does Christ want you to do this morning? If you do not know for sure, if you can't go back to a time in your life and say, this is when I trusted Jesus as my Savior. If you don't have that moment, this morning, he says, today, today, call upon the Lord while He's near. What He wants you to do this morning is just ask Him into your life. Something like this. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Please come into my life. Forgive my sin and save my soul. If you can pray that prayer and mean it as best you know how with what faith you've got, Lord, I I believe in you. I accept you as my Savior. Please come into my heart and forgive my sin and save my soul. The Bible said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, say it with me, saved. saved. Say that again. Saved. Doesn't that have such a wonderful feel? Yes. Saved. One day, and I don't know when, it could be today, it could be a hundred years from now. I do know this, all of, the, all of the signs are lined up, everything is ready. That one day there's going to be a shout. 
there's going to be a sound of a trumpet and there's going to be a voice cry, come up hither. And at that moment, everyone that's born again will be taken out of here. Everyone that's lost will be left behind. If it were to happen right now, how many of you can say, I know for sure I'm ready to go. I know I'm saved. I've asked Christ to save me. I know I'm saved. I do, I do, I do, I do. Let's bow our heads this morning. The heads bowed and eyes closed. In a moment when we stand, let me help you. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, the evidence supporting the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is so overwhelming, no real thinking person can question it. What have you done about it? It's not enough just to believe that Jesus is. The Bible says, Thou believest there's one God, the devils believe and tremble. No, you've got to accept what He did for you. Accept that free gift. Scripture says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want you to silently just stand to your feet with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Just quietly stand to your feet, heads bowed and eyes closed. Right now there's a reaching out to you. God wants you saved. All of the Bible is all about you trusting Christ as your Savior. God wants you to open your heart to Him. Believe that He is the Savior. Believe that He did die on the cross for you. Believe that He will save you if you'll ask Him this morning. So if you could not raise your hand a moment ago that you're 100% sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. Pray with me right now. Pray this prayer from your heart right now. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please come into my heart. Forgive my sin and save my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Now while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, no one's looking around. If you prayed that prayer with me just now and you meant it, would you slip your hand up? I, I prayed that prayer and I meant that from my heart. Wherever you might be, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, just raise your hand and hold it up. I see your hand. Yes. Someone else, slip that hand up. I prayed the prayer just now and I meant it. I meant it. God bless you. I see your hand. Yes. Anyone else? Unashamed. Unashamed. Now, while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, you may, you may close your eyes. And, and those of you that just raised your hand, would you lift your head and look at me? Let me say a personal word to you. You meant that when you prayed that prayer? Sir, did you mean that when you prayed the prayer with me? Did you mean that? Did you mean that when you prayed the prayer? Did you mean that? The Bible said, whosoever believeth in him should not be ashamed. You're not ashamed, are you, of Jesus? You're not ashamed and you're not. The Bible said, if you'll confess me before men, that means to own him. If you'll own me in front of the world, I'll own you before my Father and the holy angels. So in a moment we begin to sing, would you step out and meet me right here? Unashamed, would you do that? Would you do that? Would you do that? All right, in a moment we're going to begin to sing when we do meet me right down front. Others in here, maybe you need to just come to the altar and say, God, Thank you for what Resurrection Sunday really means. Some of you may be looking for a church home. Come and say, I want to be a part of Starlight. I want to help you. I want to help you. Whatever the need is, as we sing, would you come right now? Step out and come now. Have thine own way. That's the way. That's the way. Come right on. Come right Have on. Have thine own way. Yield it and stay.
long this morning but maybe you're standing by a loved one or friend why don't you tell them I'll go with you if you'd like to go to the altar and get some things settled this morning maybe I'm talking to some that are Christians you're believers you love the Lord but you're just not where you once were you've not been serving him the way you once did and this morning maybe God has spoken to your heart about maybe rededicating your life, getting a new start. What about that this morning? The moment we begin to sing this last verse, find a way to come to the altar. God, I want I want a new fire in my life. I want it to burn in my heart like it once did. Whatever that need is, tell your loved one, your friend, I'll go with you. Come to the altar. That's what the altar is for. Come and find a place here before God and the whole world. And say, I love you, Jesus, with all of my heart. Let's sing this final verse. Let's sing it together. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Hold o'er my being. Absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. And you may be seated. See, we have some that are still being dealt with. I know we have a, one that came got reassurance. Got you, you know you saved now? Got that settled? Amen. Amen. Two others that are being dealt with to receive Christ as Savior, and we'll present them at a later time. Praise the Lord for His saving power. Amen. Amen. We're so happy to have those of you that are visiting with us. Some of you, maybe for the first time, others have been visited before, but so glad to have you. Remember, tonight we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper. So let's all stand, shall we? Jesus said He's coming again. So keep looking up. It's not coming from below. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one. They'll know we are Christians by our love. All right, let me quickly make announcements concerning the Easter egg hunt. Zero to three-year-olds are going to be between the annex building. This is the building right outside here in the old, uh, the old uh, Sunday school building. There will be people in, in out there to help direct. The four- and five-year-olds are going to be in front of the kids' church building. Uh, Brother Tim, that's on the other side, correct? The old uh, church auditorium, the kids four and five-year-olds are going to be over on that side. Grades first through third grade are going to be right outside here along the gymnasium. Uh, First through third grade. Grades fourth and up are going to be across the street. There will be people to help them cross the street. Watch out again for cars coming. But fourth grade and up. Teenagers, all the teenagers are going to be in the annex building. They've got pizza provided for the teenagers. And so uh, uh, this is it. Folks, do not, nobody do anything until you hear the word go. 
and then they'll uh, they'll announce go, and then everybody can start.